And a very good evening to you all. I'm Anthony Murphy. This is Mythical Ireland Live and welcome to Live Irish Myths and Legends episode 10. Can you believe we've been doing this every day and it's now day 10. Hope you're all keeping well no matter where you are in the world. Hope you're keeping safe and healthy and that all your family and loved ones are in good stead. And I have to say I'm overwhelmed with the lovely response there has been to the live stories and the way that people are joining in the discussion all the comments and questions and the feedback online from the youtube videos and indeed by email has been terrific so i want to say thanks for that it's heartening for me it's a very difficult time for everybody it's a time of great uncertainty and uh, it's a very good exercise in terms of keeping our mind off things so, uh, episode 10 is about Mananon MacLear, who is essentially the Irish or Celtic god of the sea. Um, and I hope you find this one interesting. I should mention that if you want to support Mythical Ireland and you like what is happening on here, um, you can do so at Patreon by becoming a patron. There's absolutely no obligation on you to do so, so don't be worrying. There's absolutely uh, no pressure whatsoever. But if you thought you could spare a dollar a month or five dollars a month or ten dollars a month or a thousand dollars a month, <laughs> just saying, <laughs> um, you could do so by following the link that I'm just about to paste in as uh, a comment below this video. Jacqueline Kennedy is watching one of the regulars. Hello, Jacqueline. Kith Cranog, hope you had a great time up at Lock Crew this past couple of mornings. Kith saw some of your pictures, looked fantastic. Vicky is watching from Oregon. Hello again, Vicky. You're very welcome along to this evening's little storytelling and chat and regaling uh, about Irish mythology. So I suppose we should introduce Mananon first and foremost rather than getting straight into reading his stories and the best introduction so um, if you're looking for uh, we've we've mentioned these previously but you know I'm, I want to give a good plug to all the books that I use as references uh, and especially at this time if you're indoors uh, get online order your books get them sent to you because all of those things in Ireland at least are still operating or most mostly a very good guide to Irish mythology is by Dara Smith and that is a guide to Irish mythology and that is Printed in Ireland by Colour Books. Now that was uh, originally published in 1988, republished in 1996. Not sure if it's still in print or if you'd have to get it secondhand. That's a very good one. Uh, previously mentioned is Dahi O'Hogoyne, the late great Dr. Dahi O'Hogoyne. Uh, you might have seen me reading from a smaller condensed version of this, but this is the earlier edition. Myth, Legend and Romance, an Encyclopedia of the Irish Folk Tradition by Dr. Dahi O'Hogan. And that was published by Prentice Hall Press back in ooh, 1991. So that's, whew, that's nearly 30 years. Oh, my maths is actually good for a change, isn't it? It is 30 years, isn't it? And my favourite of all the uh, dictionary slash encyclopedias is James McKillop's Oxford Dictionary of Celtic Mythology, which is the one I'm going to read a little bit about Mananon from. I uh, just have to catch up with some of the comments here. Uh, Julianne Osborne is watching. Hello, Julianne. Great to see you in watching. Catherine Woodruff is in Wisconsin. Hello again, Catherine. Uh, Matthew Byrne. Hi, Matt. Matt is watching from here in Drogheda. Uh, Paula Farrell is in County Down. Hello, Paula. You're very welcome along. Evie Hanlon says, cool bananas. <laughs> that's that's an Irish one, isn't it? Not bananas as such. Emmet Nihan is a bit of an off, off topic question, but has there been any further news on the possible key at Brunabonia? Thanks, Anthony. Your reading really transports one to another world. I'm always glad to find out more. Looking forward to tonight's greeting from Drun. Drum Conrath, oh Drum Conrath in County Meath, brilliant, you're sure you're only up the road. No further word, I'm afraid, uh, and I mean, in fairness, what we were presented with at the Pleasant Boyne conference, and you can get information about that online. It's not that it was sparse, uh, it's just that it, it was a sonar investigation of the river, so it would have to be followed up on um, by actually, you know, getting into the river, whether that involves diving 
uh, underwater archaeology, etc. But don't worry, as soon as there's news, I will do my best to keep you uh, posted. Aaron Durrett is in. Hi, Anthony. Hi, everybody. Mananon is my boy. Well, there you go. We'll see how much you enjoy tonight. Catherine Wall McManus says, Hi, Anthony. Hello, Catherine. You're very welcome. Barb Jordan. Hello, Barb. Welcome back and good for you to come along. Maria Mahan, uh, who is a top fan of Mythical Ireland and a regular, is also in. Hello, Maria. Evie Hanlon. Hi from North Queensland in Australia. What kind of hour of the day is it there? It must be 4, 3, 4, 5 a.m. in the morning. Wow. David Gilroy is watching. Hello, David. You're very welcome. Jeannie Jessup is in North Carolina in USA. Hello and welcome back, Jeannie. Good to have you along. Margaret Ring. Evening, everyone. Hi, Margaret. Hope you're keeping well. Carolyn Logan is in Sarasota in Florida. Hope it's nice and warm down there. Send a little bit of, it, of that sunshine up here. We had a couple of days of sunshine, but today was very, very dull. Philip Murray is watching from Santa Maris in California. Hello, Philip, and you're very welcome along. Wow, that's a good start. We've Even before I get through the comments, I haven't, haven't read anything else, and they're still coming in. Catty McMahon waves from Michigan. Hello, Catty. And Tara Greer Malouf is in Los Angeles in California. Um, if it's 8pm here, is it 1pm there? Wow. And Evie Hanlon says 6am up in the north. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's that's not too bad. Athboy in this together says, Good man, Anthony. Fantastic stuff. So glad to have you all along. And it is just brilliant. It's heartwarming for me to see such a wonderful reaction. So we're just going to introduce Mananon. He's the principal sea deity and also otherworldly ruler of Irish and Gaelic traditions. Never a creature of a single cycle of Irish literature, Mananon appears in all four cycles. The mythological cycle, the Ulster cycle, the Fenian or Finn cycle and the cycle of kings as well as in later oral tradition. And this is very rare because, I mean, for instance, with the Dogda, who we dealt with, I think, in, was it episode, it might have been episode five, with the Dogda, the Dogda kind of fades into insignificance to an extent after Angus takes over Sheed and Broga. Um, Mananon is one that arises time and time again throughout the various phases of mythology. Please talk about his connection to the Amadon Moor or Dove and the stories of MacArt and O'Donnell. Well, if we don't get round to that tonight, Aaron, we'll get back to it because, you know, I'm hoping to do these every day uh, for who knows how far into the future, hopefully for a long, long time. And we'll get to cover loads and loads of topics. Nolan Proctor is speaking in Irish. Er yash er fad, ta gra agum er mita shaliacht na Celtic. OK, so... Uh, very nice, and uh, you love the what is that word? Mita Shaliacht is that mythology, Celtic mythology. Good and very welcome along, Nolan. Good to see you in there. Mananon is sometimes, but not usually, numbered as a lord of the Tuatha de Danann. Well, of course, Mananon is mentioned, isn't he? As uh, well, he's in Altrun Chia Gawather, isn't he, in relation to Newgrange? And isn't he also in um, Tuchmark Eitain? Clearly of divine origin, Mananon was never successfully humanised by Christian literary tradition, despite his portrayal in the 10th century Shan Shanas Cormac, Cormac's glossary, as a celebrated merchant and pilot of the Irish Sea. In the oldest Irish tradition, Mananon rules the otherworldly Awan Ablach, but rides out at will in his chariot over the waves, as if they were solid land. His other realms are Tir Tóngre, which is the land of promise, and Maimel, or Magmel, the plain of happiness. In later tradition, he appears to be more of a trickster and magician. The name Mananon may derive from earlier names for the Isle of Man, not the other way around as commonly supposed. In Old Irish, the island was Mana and Manand, and the Romans used the term Mona for Anglesey. A gloss of Mananon might be he of the Isle of Man or he of the Irish Sea. In Irish tradition, more, however, Mananon does not reside on the Isle of Man, but rather on Awan Ablock, an imaginary island near the coast of Alba, Scotland, sometimes confused with the Isle of Man. So there you go. 
Just making sure. I don't want to read too much from any source because I don't want to breach copyright. So I highly recommend it, folks, that you go and get your copy. And I think this is actually online. You can search uh, uh, for this online. Uh, actually, I'll just see very quickly if I can. Um, Oxford Dictionary Celtic Mythology. I'll see if I can. I know you can all do your own Google searches, but just for the sake of handiness. Uh, Oxford reference online I believe this is in, in uh, available in its entirety online but you have to search it I don't think you can browse it subject by subject I'll just uh, paste that in there as a link so that you can follow that source from yourself Raymond Delano is in South Carolina in the US uh, welcome along Raymond very good afternoon to you it's evening time here in Ireland and I'm going to read again from the very popular uh, Gods and Fighting Men uh, one of Lady Gregory's books um, and we spoke the other night about how some people don't uh, rate the translations very well but when we com compared uh, some of the stories uh, we found that they were quite accurate now as to Mananon the proud son of Lear after he had made places for the rest of the Tuatadanon to live in and that's interesting because remember in the Gawal in Shida it is the Dagda who makes the monuments for the Tuatadanon to live in at Brunabonia. He went away out of Ireland himself and some said that he was dead and that he got his death by Ilan Fiberjurg of the Red Edge in battle, pardon me. And it is what they said, that the battle was fought at my Coolan, and that the, and that Mananon was buried standing on his feet. And no sooner was he buried than a great lake burst up under his feet in the place that was a red bog till that time. Samantha Healy says, hello, Anthony. Very good evening to you, Samantha. And the lake got the name of Luch Orbson from one of the names of Mananon. And it was said that Red Bob was glad and many women were sorry at that battle. It's unusual for a story about somebody to start with his end rather than his beginning. But he had many places of living and he was often heard of it in Ireland after. It was he sent a messenger to Etain, mother of Conora, the High King. That's Conora Moore, who, who you'll meet in the stories about the Hill of Tara. The time she was hidden in the cowherd's house. And it was he brought up Deirdre's children in Awan of the Apple Trees. That's Awan a Ablock that we mentioned. And it was said of that place, quote, A house of peace is the hill of the She of Awan, unquote. And it was he taught Jermud of the Fianna to use the, the use of weapons. And it was he taught Cuchulain the use of the gay bullock. <laughs> and that's very interesting. We dealt with Skahawk the other night, the shadowy figure in Alba to whom Cuchulain goes across the sea to complete his training. And some say it was he was Deirdre's father and that he brought Crohor, king of Ulster, to the place she was hidden, and he running with the appearance of a hare before the hounds of the men of Ulster to bring them there. Martin Hughes is watching. Hello, Martin. Hope you're keeping well and healthy and sound and all that. Uh, and uh, thanks for joining us. Simone is hello from a fellow storyteller. I am a native storyteller. You're very welcome, Simone. Very glad to hear that other people are still telling the old tales. Isn't it lovely? Wouldn't I do well now if I could tell all these off by heart? And it is what they say, that the time Crohor had brought the sons of Ishnach to Awan Macha, he could not come to the, at them to kill them because of their bravery. It was to Mananon he went for help. And Mananon said he would give him no help, for he had told him at the time he brought Deirdre away that she would be the cause of the breaking up of his kingdom, and he took her away in spite of him. But Crohor asked him to put up blindness for a while on the sons of Ishnach, or the whole army would be destroyed with their blows. And just to let you know that I do intend, and I think we've said it already, I will tell the tale of Deirdre and the sons of Ishnach in a later episode, in its, in its complete version. So after a while he consented to that. And when the sons of Ishnach came out again against the army of Ulster, the blindness came on them. And it was at one another they struck, not seeing who was near them. And it was by one another's hands they fell. But more say Mananon had no hand in it. And that it was Kapad, the druid, put a sea about them and brought them to their death by his enchantments. Dawn Hilton says, hi, I love the ancient tales. And so do I, Dawn. You're very welcome. A very good evening to you. 
And some say Cullen the Smith, that gave his name to Cuchulain afterwards, was Mananon himself, for he had many shapes. Uh, pardon me for a moment while I mark that. Mm -hmm. I know. I should know that and I should have remembered it, but I need to mark it. Anyway, before Cullen came to Ulster, he was living in the island of Falga. That was one of Mananon's places. And one time before Crohor came into the kingdom, he went to ask advice of a druid, and the druid bade him go to the island of Falga and to ask Cullen, the smith he would find there, to make arms for him. So Crohor did so, and the smith promised to make a sword and spear and shield for him. And while he was working at them, Crohor went out one morning early to walk on the strand, and there he saw a sea woman asleep on the shore. And he put bonds on her in her sleep, the way she would not make her escape. But when she awoke and saw what had happened, she asked him to set her free. And I am Chiawal, she said, one of the queens of the sea. And bid Coolan, she said, that is making your shield for you, to put my likeness on it and my name about it. I, I feel a romantic tale coming along here. And whenever you will go into battle with that shield, the strength of your enemies will lessen and your own strength and the strength of your people will increase. Federica is saying hello from Torino in northern Italy. Hello, Federica. A very good evening to you. And I hope you are keeping well amidst all the trouble that we are having. And all of the best wishes and blessings from Ireland to you and all the wonderful people of Italy. So Crohor let her go and bade the smith do as she had told him. And when he went back to Ireland, he got the victory wherever he brought that shield. <laughs> and he sent for Cullen then and offered him a place on the plains of Moorhevna. Now Moorhevna, we've dealt with already and we'll probably encounter it many times in our journeys through the tales, was the ancient name of what is today mostly in County Louth, my own county, stretching all the way from the Boyne River to the north of the county and is named after the sea or the magic sea that once covered the plain. Uh, the one in which the Mata was said to have swum and the dog that killed the Mata and drained the water away. Dawn Hilton says, sounds like the Pirate Queen indeed and there are so many similarities, aren't there? So he offered him a place on the plains of Merhevna. And whether he was or was not Mananon, it is likely he gave Cuchulain good teaching the time he stopped with Indera after killing his great dog. Mananon had good hounds one time, but they went hunting, hunting after a pig that was destroying the whole country. And we have echoes immediately here of the story of the race or the run of the black pig. Simone says, may eagles always fly with you. Thanks very much, Simone. That's very lovely. So the pig was destroying the whole country and making a dessert. Desert. <laughs> Definitely not a dessert. <laughs> making a, des a desert of it. I nearly did it again. He's making wobbly jelly of it. No, not that, not that kind of. D-E-S-E-R-T. Definitely a, a desert. Live TV. Can't beat it. And they followed it till they came to a lake and there it turned on them. And no hound of them escaped alive, but they were all drowned or maimed. And the pig made for an island then that got the name of Mukinish, the pig's island afterwards. And the lake got the name of Luk Kun, the, the lake of the hounds. And it was through Mananon, the wave of Tuig, one of the three great waves of Ireland, got its name. And this is the way that happened. There was a young girl of the name of Tuig, a fosterling of Cunnera the High King, was reared in Chower, that's Tara, and a great company of the daughters of the kings of Ireland were put about her to protect her, the way she would be kept for a king's asking. But Mananon sent Fir Diad of the Tuad Adanan, sorry, Fir Fir Diad of the Tuad Adanan, that was a pupil of his own and a druid, in the shape of a woman of his own household, and he went where Tuig was and sang a sleep spell over her and brought her away to Inverglas, which is, glass is green, isn't it? Uh, as in the glass go govnan, govlin, and Inver is uh, an estuary or uh, a river inlet. And there he laid her down while he went looking for a boat that he might bring her away in her sleep to the land of the ever-living women. But a wave of the flood tide came over the girl and she was drowned. And Mananon killed Fir Ferdiad in his anger. And once again we see this underlying uh, uh, 
uh, theme about the, the Jay Danans that some people think they're all love and light and they're not always love and light. There are there are there is violence and killing as well. So we have to take that into account in these things. And one time Mananon's cows came up out of the sea at Balia Cronin, three of them, a red and a white and a black. And the people that were there saw them standing on the strand for a while, as if thinking. And then they all walked up together side by side from the strand. And at that time there were no roads in Ireland. And there was a great wonder on the people, wonder on the people when they saw a good wide road ready before the three cows to walk on. And when they got about a mile from the sea, they parted. The white cow went to the northwest towards Limnach, and the red cow went to the southwest and on round the coast of Ireland, and the black cow went to the northeast toward, towards Lishmore in the district of Port Lariga, and a road opened before each of them that is to be seen to this day. And some say it was Mananon went to Finn and the Fianna in the form of the Gilla Decker, the bad servant, and brought them away to land under wave. Cheer for fo tin, isn't that the land under wave? Anyway, he used to often go hunting with them on Knuck Anya, and sometimes he came to their help. So that's the chapter called Mananon, and we're going to read the next one called Mananon at Play. I need a drink. That is not a Canon lens, it's actually a cup. Novelty cup. See, I'm a Nikon camera user, so... You know, cannon, drink out of them. Mananon at play. And it was he went playing tricks throughout Ireland a long time after that again, the time he got the name of O'Donnell's Cairn. And it, it was the way it happened. E. Dove O'Donnell was holding a feast one time in Bella Hoseneg, and his, peace were, his people were boasting of the goddess, goodness, goodness, not goddess, definitely goodness, of, of the goodness of his house and of his musicians. And while they were talking, they saw a clown coming towards them. Old striped clothes he had, and puddle water splashing in his shoes, and his sword sticking out naked behind him, and his ears through the old cloak that was over his head. And in his hand he had three spears of Hollywood, scorched and blackened. He wished O'Donnell good, he good health, and O'Donnell did the same to him, and asked where did he come from. It is where I am, he said. I slept last night at Dun Monia of the King of Alban. I am a day in Eel, a day in Kyomtira, a day in Rachlan, a day in the watchman's seat in Schlieffuad. A pleasant, rambling, wandering man I am. And it is with yourself I am now, O'Donnell, he said. Let the gatekeeper... I'm very sorry, Matt. I will try to watch it. Yes, I'll try to read properly. I apologise. This is live, you know. I can't do... There's no outtakes here. Well, it's full of outtakes, should I say. And the gate, and when the gatekeeper, sorry, uh, it, it is with yourself I am now, O'Donnell, he said. Let the gatekeeper be brought to me, said O'Donnell. And when the gatekeeper came, he asked, was it he let in this man? And the gatekeeper said he did not, and that he never saw him before. Let him off, O'Donnell, said the stranger, for it was as easy for me to come in as it would be for me to go out again. There was wonder on them all then, any man to have come into the house without passing the gate. The musicians began playing their music then, and all the best musicians of the country were there at the time, and they played very sweet tunes on their harps. But the strange man called out, By my word, O'Donnell, there was never a noise of hammers beating on iron in any bad place, was so bad to listen to as this noise your people are making. With that, he took a harp, and he made music that would put women in their pains, and wounded men after a battle into a sweet sleep. And it is what O'Donnell said. Since I first heard talk of the music of the she that is playing in the hills and under the earth below us, I never heard better music than your own. And it is a very sweet player you are, he said. One day I am sweet, another day I am sour, said the clown. And that's very interesting about the talk of the she and the music that is played in the hills and under the earth below us, which the she realm where the Daedanans had retreated to after their uh, <clears throat> defeat by the Milesians, the sons of the king of Spain, Mil, uh, that that realm was supposed to have been, you know, in the hills and under the ground, in the earth, as it were. Then O'Donnell bade his people to bring bring him up to sit near himself. I have no mind to do that, he said. I would sooner be as I am. 
an ugly clown making sport for high up people. Then O'Donnell sent him down clothes, a hat and a striped shirt and a coat and he would not have them. I have no mind, he said, to let high up people be making a boast of giving them to me. They were afraid then that he might go from them and they put 20 armed horsemen and 20 men on foot, men on foot to hold him back from leaving the house and as many more outside at the gate for they knew him not to be a man of this world. What are these men for, said he? They are to keep you here, said O'Donnell. By my word, it is not with you I will be eating my supper tomorrow, he said, but at Knuck on you, where Sha- Sharon, son of the Earl, is in Desmoman. If I find you giving one store out of yourself between this and morning, I will knock you into a round lump there on the ground, said O'Donnell. But at that the stranger took up the harp again, and he made the same sweet music as before. And when they were all listening to him, he called out to the men outside, Here I am coming, and watch me well now, or you will lose me. When the men that were watching the gate heard that, they lifted up their axes to strike at him. But in their haste, it was at one another they struck, till they were all lying, stretched in blood. Then the clown said to the gatekeeper, let you ask twenty cows and a hundred of free land of O'Donnell as a fee for bringing his people back to life. And take this herb, he said, and rub it in the mouth of each man of them and he will rise up whole and well again. So the gatekeeper did that and he got the cows and the land from O'Donnell and he brought all the people to life again. Now at that time Shagan, son of the Earl, was holding a gathering on the green in front of his dun. And he saw the same man coming towards him and dressed in the same way and the water splashing in his shoes. But when he asked who who was he, he gave himself the name of a very learned man. Durtan o Durtan, he said. And he said it was by Esrua he was come and by Kesh Corin and from that to Corsleave and to my lord my lord of the Dagda, and into the district of Heconal Gaura. Till I came to yourself, he said, by Crochen of Mig E, and that's Crochen, Rath Crochen, in uh, modern day Roscommon. Margaret says, Knock Anya is near the Grange Stone Circle, indeed. So they brought him into the house, and gave him wine for drinking, and water for washing his feet, and he slept till the rising of the sun on the morrow. And at that time, Shagan, son of the Earl, came to visit him, and he said, It is a long sleep you had, and there is no wonder in that, and your journey so long yesterday. But I often heard of your learning in books, and of your skill on the harp, and I would like to hear you this morning, he said. I am good in those arts indeed, said the stranger. So they brought him a book, but he could not read a word of it. And then they brought him a harp, and he could not play any tune. It is likely your reading and your music are gone from you, said Shagan, and he read... He made a little ran on him, saying it was a strange thing, Dortan o Dortan, that had such a great name, not to be able to read a line of a book, or even to remember one. But when the stranger heard how he was being mocked at, he took up the book, and read from the top to the bottom of the page very well, and in a sweet-sounding voice. And after that he took the harp, and played, and sang the same way he did at O'Donnell's house the day before. It is a very sweet man of learning you are, said Shagan. One day I am sweet, another day I am sour, said the stranger. They walked out together then on Knuck Anya. But while they were talking there, the stranger was gone all of a minute, and Shagan, son of the Earl, could not see where he went. Dana Hicks has just joined us from San Diego in California. Very good afternoon to you, Dana. Thank you very much for everything, and I hope you're keeping well. After that, he went on. And he reached Schligach, that's Sligo, just at the time O'Crohor was setting out with the men of Connacht to avenge the Connacht hag's basket on the hag of Munster. And this time he gave himself the name of the Gilla Decker, or the Bad Servant. Pardon the dog, he's outside and he's barking. And he joined with the men of Connacht and they went over to the Shunan west into Munster, that's the Shannon River. And they were hunted and drove every creature, sorry, and there they hunted and drove every, every creature that could be made travel, cattle and horses and flocks, into one place till they got the hornless bull of the monster hag and her two speckled cows. And O'Crohor brought them away to give to the Connacht hag in satisfaction for her basket. 
Hmm, now one wonders about that basket. Is this similar to the apron and the apron full of stones that the Kalyuk dropped at La Cru? Must follow that one up. But the men of Munster made an attack on them as they were going back. And the Gila Decker asked O'Crohor, would he sooner have the cows driven or have the Munster men checked? And he said he would sooner have the Munster men checked. So the Gila Decker turned on them. And with his bow and 24 arrows, he slept that he kept them back till O'Crohor and his people were safe out of their reach in Connacht. But he took some offence then on account of O'Crohor taking the first drink himself when they came into his house and not giving it to him that had done so much. And he took his leave and went from them on the moment. And after that, he went to where Ch- Tyg O'Kelly was. That's Tyg O'Kelly. And having his old striped clothes and his old shoes as before. And when they asked him what art he had, he said, I'm, I'm good at tricks. And if you'll give me five marks, I will show you a trick, he said. I will give you that, said Tyg. With that, the stranger put three rushes on the palm of his hand. I will blow away the middle rush now, he said, and the other two will stop as they are. So they told him to do that, and he put the tops of two of his fingers on the two outside rushes and blew the middle one away. <laughs> There's a trick for you now, Tygo Kelly, he said to them. He said then, by my word, that is not a bad trick, said O'Kelly. But one of his men said that there may be no good luck with him that did it. And give me half of that money now, Tyg, he said. And I will do the same trick for you myself. I will give you the half of what I got if you will do it, said the stranger. So the other put the rushes on his hand. But if he did, when he tried to do the trick, his two fingertips went through the palm of his hand. Ob, 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 said the stranger. That is not the way I did the trick. But as you have lost the money, he said, I will heal you again. I could do another trick for you, he said. I could wag the ear on one side of my head and the ear on the other side would say, stay still. Do it then, said O'Kelly. So the man of tricks took hold of one of his ears and wagged it up and down. That is a good trick indeed, said O'Kelly. I will show you another one now, he said. And with that, he took a bag from his bag, a thread of silk, and gave a cast of it up into the air that it was made fast to a cloud. And then he took a hair out of the same bag, that bag, that's a H-A-R-E, and it ran up the thread and then took out a little dog and laid it, laid it on after the hair and it followed yelping on its track. And after that again, he brought out a little serving boy and bade him to follow the dog and hair up the thread. Then out of another bag he had with him, he brought out a beautiful, well-dressed young woman and bade her to follow after the hound and the boy and to take care and not to let the hair be torn by the dog. She went up then quickly after them, and it was a delight to Tygo Kelly to be looking at them and to be listening to the sound of the hunt going on in the air. All was quiet then for a long time, and then the man of tricks said, I am afraid there is some bad work going on up there. What is that? said O'Kelly. I am thinking, said he, the hound might be eating the hare and the serving boy courting the girl. <laughs> it is likely enough they are, said O'Kelly. With that, the stranger drew in the thread, and it is what he found, the boy making love to the girl, and the hound chewing the bones of the hare. There was great anger on the man of tricks when he saw that, and he took his sword and struck the head off the boy. I do not like a thing of that sort to be done in my presence, said Tygo Kelly. If it did not please you, I can set it all right again, said the stranger. And with that he took up the head and made a cast of it at the body, and it joined to it. And the young man stood up. But if he did, his face his face was turned backwards. <laughs> it would be better for him to be dead than to be living like that, said O'Kelly. When the man of tricks heard that, he took hold of the boy and twisted his head straight. And he was as well as before. <laughs> You need eyes in the back of your head, isn't that what they say? <laughs> that is the way Man and On used to be going around Ireland, doing tricks and wonders. And no one could keep him in any place. And if he was put on a gallows itself, he would be found safe in the house after, and some other man on the gallows in his place. But he did no harm, 
and those that would be put to death by him, he would bring them to life again with a herb out of his bag. So in some ways we're seeing here a healing aspect of Mananon. A little bit like Dean Kecht, you know. The ability to bring people back to life with a herb. I wish he could give us a herb to, uh, to uh, fight off COVID-19 and to keep it at bay. And all the food he would use would be a vessel of sour milk and a few crab apples. And there never was any sweeter music than the music he used to be playing. And that is from Lady Gregory's Gods and Fighting Men. And we return momentarily to Dahi O'Hogan. And B Barry Kieran is watching. Hello, Barry. You're very welcome along. Hope you're keeping well. Margaret says there is a signpost at Loch Gur and it says Balliant Nakalia. Well, she's all over the place, Margaret. She is ubiquitous in place names uh, and indeed in stories. Mananon, Otherworld Lord and Mythical Mariner. The, the, yeah, OK, so we're going to talk a little bit. We're going to repeat a little bit, but you're not to worry because that's the thing. We're just trying to make sure that, uh, uh, well, me as much as anyone uh, is aware of all these things. Some literary sources claim that Orbshu was another name for Mananon. A character called Orbshu was the reputed ancestor of the Cunmachna sept, which had settled in Connacht, but which was of Leinster origin. It thus appears that the lore of Mananon originated with the Leinster men, and that it was they who coined the name Mananon for the divine personage associated with them, by them, with an eastern isle. By them, and later by the rest of the people of Ireland, Mananon came to be regarded as the deity who ruled the other world. The faraway island, which was the realm of this deity, when not specifically understood to be Mana, was known as Maimial Ma 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 or Magmel, the pleasant plain, Tir Thorngere, the land of promise, or as Awan Ablach, Awan Aulach, the region of apples. The fertile lore concerning the other world ensured that the character Mananon underwent rapid dramatic development, probably in the early centuries AD. Welsh storytellers adopted him from the Irish and portrayed him as a master craftsman and trickster. They called him Mananwydan Fablir. Um, I have no idea how to pronounce the Welsh. I'm very sorry. Somebody may be able to give us a uh, phonetic um, a phonetic pronunciation as a comment uh, beneath the video. The element Manon being replaced by M-A-N-A-W-Y-D since Mana, M-A-N-A-W, was the Welsh name for the Isle of Man. Being a divine personage and situated on an island, Mananon was naturally envisaged as having a special connection with the sea. For this reason, he was known as MacLear, which was a way of describing one who is accustomed to the water and which meant literally son of the sea. Pardon me. Thus the ocean was poetically claimed to be his domain. It being to him solid earth and a flowery plain, and its fish being his calves and lambs. He was described as driving his chariot over the waters, the waves were his horses, and he was accordingly the rider of the maned sea. He had one particular horse, which was called Envar, literally water foam, and one kenning for the waves. Uh, kenning is a, a poetic combination of two words uh, to symbolise something. And one kenning for the waves was the locks of Mananon's wife. Sometimes he himself was identified with the waves. And one text has him travelling in the following manner. For the space of nine waves he would be submerged in the sea. But he would rise on the crest of the tenth without wetting chest or breast. And that's, ver <coughs> pardon me, that's very interesting. Because in Lower Gawala, when the Milesians are trying to take Ireland from the Dedanans, they reach an agreement with the Dedanans that they're going to go back out to sea by a distance of nine waves. And that if they can arrive and land back on uh, Irish soil again, then they can take Ireland. <coughs> that they can take possession of it. Uh, and it is assumed that the storm th then raised, uh, which wrecks half of the Milesian fleet, and we won't go too deep into that because that's for a future episode, uh, was raised by Mananon. Oh, I, although I don't think that is explicitly said in uh, Laura Gawala, the Book of Invasions. 
The most humanising account is a 9th century glossary. Here he is described as, quote, a celebrated merchant who was in the Isle of Man, unquote. And furthermore, as a great mariner who, quote, knew by studying the heavens when there would be fine weather and when there would be bad weather, unquote. Uh, and I wonder whether Mananon was the first one in Ireland who said, you know, uh, red sky in the morning, sailor's warning, red sky at night, sailor's delight, or shepherd if you're not a mariner. A text from the 8th century has him coming from the Isle of Man to beget the hero king Mungon. And another form, another from the same period, has his wife Fan coming to see to seek the love of Cúchulainn. Fan, F A N N, also spelt in the old stories, Fan, F A N D. In both these cases, he is presented as a spiritual being who appears and disappears at various places as he wills. <clears throat> a twelfth-century account has him visiting Cormac MacArt, who, of course, is one of the famous high kings of Tara and bringing members of that king's family away to the happy otherworld called Tyr Thorngre. He is described as finely clad and carrying on his shoulder a branch with three golden apples. The apples touching each other made del delightful music which would soothe to sleep all those who were sick or wounded. The parallel is obvious here between this region of the apples and its cognate, the Avalon of Arthurian Romance, which was derived from Celtic sources. Francis Smith says, thanks again for your good work. Very happy to do it, Francis, and to try and cheer everybody up uh, and to take our minds off things. You're very welcome this evening to episode 10 of Live Irish Myths, which today is about Mananon MacLear, the sea god of the ancient Irish uh, in, in, in its old myths. Mananon was not numbered among the divine community, Tuadadanan, in earlier literature. But by the 10th or 11th century, he was being treated as one of them. We read in a late medieval text that, after their defeat by the Gaelic people, he came from his overseas domain to the Tuhaday and advised them, to, advised them to take up residence in the mounds and hillocks and lonely places of Ireland. He appointed a special she, brackets, cairn dwelling, close brackets, to each of the Tuhaday nobles and presented three great gifts to them. The first of these gifts was the Faith Fiada, and we mentioned that the other day, didn't we? Literally, art of semblance, understood as a cloak of concealment through which they could make themselves invisible. Aaron Durrett says, Mananon brings the healing music of the she. Indeed he does. The second gift was the Feast of Gobnu or Go Goinu, the celebration of which warded off age and death from their kings. And the third was the pigs of Mananon, the swine which would come alive again after being hunted and killed. And this is very interesting because in the tales about uh, Shedenbroga, Sheonvru, Newgrange, the Dagda is said to have had two pigs in Brunabonia, one uh, fattened and ready for the slaughter and one cooking on the spit, uh, uh, which we mentioned in at least one previous episode, if not several. Then he made a circuit of the two-a-day dwellings. A great feast was prepared for him by Elkmar, i.e. Nuadu, at Brunabonia, the Newgrange tumulus in County Meath. And remember, in, in one thread of mythology, in some threads of mythology, uh, the first owner of Sheed and Broga is in fact Elkmar or Nuadu, and in other threads it is in fact Dagda. Alberto says greetings from Italy and uh, uh, a great Greetings and blessings to all of you in Italy uh, during this very difficult time for you, Alberto. I hope that you're keeping well and that if you are indoors and locked down, that you're in good spirits. And the same to all your loved ones. Uh, I better repeat that. A great feast was prepared for them by Elkmar or Nuadu at Brunabonia at Newgrange. And the brew was freshly strewn with rushes before him as a welcome. Now, I think that's very interesting. And this is from Alchem, Altrum Chia Gawather, the fosterage of the house of the two milking vessels. Because what it suggests is that Newgrange may have been decorated for special occasions. 
and that what was a, a stone cairn, I know that you look at it today and you see the pictures of it and it, it's grass topped and you think it, that it's an earthen mound. Well, in fact, it is mostly made of loose water rolled stones. It is, in fact, a cairn. And I wonder whether, you know, this is something that they did at special occasions in prehistory, that they actually decorated Newgrange with rushes or reeds or grasses, you know. Mananon disliked Elkmar, however, and he encouraged Angus to displace his host as Lord of the Brew and provided a charm which compelled Elkmar to depart. And this is from, as I said, the text Althram Chiagawather. The same text also states that Mananon brought Angus on a trip to India, where they got two wonderful cows. A speckled one, which Mananon kept afterwards on his domain in Awan Aulok, and a dun cow, which Angus kept at Brunabonia. And that's very interesting, the whole idea of cows. And coming from India, of course, where the cow is a sacred animal. But the fact that Angus kept a dun cow, a brown cow, at Brunabonia. And remembering that, you know, cows from the Neolithic forward were a measure of wealth. Because they were the farmers who had introduced, far uh, they, well, they were the ones who introduced farming to Ireland. They were the ones who built the monuments. The text also relates the story of the maiden Ethna, who lives alternatively in Owen Aulok and Brunabonia, and for whom the milk of these two cows is full nourishment. And as we may have suggested in another uh, uh, episode, and we will get back to when we talk about Bowen, Ethna is in fact another name for Bowen. Margaret Ring says, red carpet to her style. <laughs> Rolling out the red carpet at Sheedenbroga, yes indeed, at Newgrange. The attribution of wonderful weapons and accoutrements to Mananon seems to have been commonplace. References are made to a great shield as well as a valuable knife and shirt which had once been his property but which came into the possession of the hero Fionn McCool. In the post-medieval stories of Fionn, indeed, Mananon is treated as a deus ex machina. A god ex machina. Hmm. Somebody with Latin can please post the translation there. A 15th century lay has him coming disguised as a warrior with a sword through his head and inciting strife among the Fianna due to his hatred for them. But elsewhere, he is friendly. <laughs> <laughs> and such is, folks, the capricious nature of different versions of Irish, ancient Irish tales. In one late prose text, for instance, he helps them on a foreign adventure by carrying, carrying them in his wonderful boat. And didn't we mention the other night that his boat was called Wave Sweeper or Ocean Sweeper? A lovely poetic name for his boat. His image in the late literature is generally that of a friendly trickster such as in two colourful texts which have him disguised as the Cairnach Coilrivach and a grey-cloaked churl. Of special interest is a ballad from the Isle of Man dating from around the end of the 15th century. In the form of rushes was paid to the inhabitants of the island. And Archdb says Deus ex machina, an unexpected power or event saving a seeming, seemingly hopeless situation, especially as a contrived plot device in a play or novel. Thank you very much for the information. Uh, and that's very much appreciated. Here, here we, we are told that rent in the form of rushes was paid to him by the inhabitants of the island. Um, Lúcher, isn't that the Irish for rushes? That's interesting because that's the, the rushes were also placed on Newgrange to welcome him. This, taken along with the medieval Irish reference to the strewing of rushes for him at Brunabonia, suggests that these wild plants, with their aquatic associations, were considered sacred to him. It also reveals that there was a permanence in the folklore concerning Mananon through the centuries. The same Manx ballad claims that Mananon was the first owner of the isle, which is described as Elan Sheant, literally other world island and he was able to conceal it from passing ships by use of a magic mist this is undoubtedly connected with his power of faith fiada but the specific ability to remove territories from the human domain was also attributed to him the sea for which he has a metaphor had a painfully obvious tendency to conceal islands and to flood the mainland thus a play on the territorial name Owl or the owls in County Mayo 
caused a medieval writer to imagine that Mananon had once, by his magic, surrounded that whole area with a cliff of brass. Ua. The association of inundations with Mananon has a long tradition attaching to it. For instance, the sources which give Orbshu as another name for him state that he died and was buried in Connacht and that a lake burst forth over his grave. This was given as the origin legend of Loch Corrib, which, according to it, was originally known as Loch Norbshan. As mentioned above, this memory of the name Orbshu is a remnant of the lore which belonged to the Conmachna, a Leinster sept which had settled in Connacht. The fact that the legend associates Mananon with water is, of course, significant, and in all probability the name Loch Norbshan was given to this lake by the Conmachna themselves. The tendency to associate inland waters with Mananon continued, and in the late, late folklore, several lakes were said to have got their names from daughters of his. These included Loch Sheelan in County Cavan, which is not too far from the Loch Crew Cairns, Lakes Enel, Owl and Deravara in County Westmeath, and we'll meet Loch Deravara again in the story of the tragic tale of the Children of Lear. And as Loch Monogue and Lake Gilna, Lake Glina, should I say, in County Mayo. In line with this also is a folk legend from West Galway which describes another daughter as going boating in, in a bay in Kilkiran. A storm arose and she was in danger of being drowned until Mananon came to her assistance. He, through his magic, caused an island to appear there and she was thus enabled to reach land. The island is called Mana. A folk legend from North Donegal puts him in the role of an exasperated parent. Three sons of his resided at the mouth of Strathbrega Bay and they persisted in bickering with each other. The enraged Mananon refused to restrain the tide for them at that bay and it burst in and drowned the three near Malin. Other aspects of his ancient portrayal also had their echoes in late folklore. In County Mayo, it was said that he was a famous magician and resided at the castle of Manin in the parish of Beckon, while West Galway lore claimed that he was a learned wizard to whom young men were sent to be educated. Furthermore, accounts have been collected from the folklore of the north northwestern part of the country, which repeat the notions that the sea waves are his horses and that storms are caused by his anger. And there is Mananon. I'm just going to check while I'm talking. I will, honestly, if I get a moment. Uh, I mean, as in, if I get a moment to get the technology working. Let's have a look here in the uh, school's folklore to see if there are any stories, especially especially locally, if there are any stories about Mananon. You know, uh, this being a coastal uh, district, uh, you know, it would be nice um, if there were. And that is, yeah, Strathbrigy, Clue Bay, another story of Strawbrega Bay, Scheel Loch Finna, and that's in Irish, so we won't be we won't be telling that. But anyway, let's briefly read this. This is some folklore that was collected in, in Ireland for, by primary school children from the elderly people in their localities in the 1930s at a time when the Irish state was a fledgling entity and when the government, which had no funds, realised that, especially after the famine, uh, and with the advancements, advancement of the English language, the continuous emigration and the loss of the Irish language, that with all that ha uh, that was going on, that the old stories were dying out. And so they made an effort to collect as many of them as possible. And one of the ways they did that was they asked the school children to collect stories from their uh, elders in the locality. Another story of Strawbrega Bay, Nile Naard or Nile of the Heights is said to rule over the hills of Nockameni, Nock Glass, Lag and Gori, and also over the Gulf of Strabregi near Malin. His queen ruled with him over this territory. Mananon MacLear is regarded as the Irish sea god and he is said to be buried in the Tun Banks off the coast of Inishowen Head. And Inishowen, of course, is the northernmost, isn't it? Yeah, the Inishowen Peninsula, Malin Head, is the northernmost tip of Ireland. Mananon is said to have submerged Nile Naard and his queen with their former castle and estate under Strabregi Loch. And that's very interesting because of the uh, 
persistent theme in folklore and in mythology of hidden realms, cities, and sometimes Klugchak, uh, the, the bell towers or the round towers, beneath the waves or beneath the lakes. Uh, Margaret is asking, Bun Mahan, County Waterford, wonder does it derive from him? Very good question, and I can't give you the answer. So maybe somebody on here can. The Irish Neptune. I wonder if I can read this on this screen without... Oh yeah, there we go. Well, the dog is getting excited by the stories. Whenever Cucullin lifted his shield and smote it, the three waves of Aaron echoed this signal and roared over ocean. Manahan has been regarded as one of the two Adidanan chiefs who fell in battle fighting against the Milesians. After death, he was renowned as a sea sprite, being surnamed Maclear or Maclear, son of the ocean. From him also, the Isle of Man or Inish Mananon was said to have derived its name. The three legs, which paradoxically are the arms of a man, are the repres. I have to go to the next page. Are the representation of the storm god carrying, careering over land and sea with a whirling motion. And this is again from the school's collection. And that's all available on ducus.ie. And I will paste that in as a comment beneath. So you can follow that link yourself and have a look at it. Mananon. Mana, Manon. Manon's castle. There was a wealthy man living in a castle in Donamoyne in the time of Column Kill. This is the Saint Column Kill. He could work witchcraft. There was a lake near the castle and at night he would draw it he would he would draw it around the castle for protection and in the morning put it back in the same place. One day a little boy was going to a well with a delf pitcher for water. Just opposite Manon's castle he met Manon. As he passed Manon that's M A N N A N he let the pitcher fall and it broke into pieces. He was greatly upset about this as he feared it would he would be scolded when he got home. Manon said he would make the picture the same as it was if he would go and ask Column Kill what sort of people went to hell. The boy said he would, so Manon at once left, left the picture as it was before it got broken. The boy then went to Column Kill and asked him the question. Column Kill explained to him the sort of people that went to hell are amongst them. He said those such as Manon. <sighs> Heavy stuff. The boy then returned to Manon and told him what Column Kill said. The boy did not know who Manon was. When Mananon, now spelt correctly, heard what Colum Kill said, he was furious. He immediately returned to his castle, collected all his gold, put it in a barrel and enchanted himself along with it in the lake. Sometime afterwards, when the people around heard that Manon's gold was in the lake, they got a diver from Dublin to investigate. When he went down, he could see the barrel all right, but there was a monstrous serpent chained to it. And here we are back to the old stories of the Mata and the Ulfest and St. Patrick defeating the snakes. Years later, this lake was to be drained and the men worked for several months at this drainage. They had the work almost completed with just one rock to blast. When night came, they had the holes drilled and were just ready, ready to pull it off. They considered they would leave it until the next morning until they have daylight to catch the fish leaving the lake and also get the gold. In the morning, crowds gathered but were greatly surprised when they found that the drain was all closed up and grass growing on it just as if there was never anything done to it. The ruins of the castle are still to be seen to the present day and it is said that anyone going inside the grounds would get weak. The lake is there also. This Above story was told to Nora J. Cooney of Gargahog in Carrick Macross, and that's in County Monaghan. Lovely, wonderful to hear the, the later sort of uh, uh, folk tales, isn't it? And one more, maybe. Let's have a look. Fairy forts are dens and places where fairies have dwelt long ago. Long years ago, Ireland, Ireland was surrounded by wild beasts of prey whom the people feared. The two Adedanans were in Ireland then, and after a while, their leader, Mananon, MacLear, made fairies of them and put them to dwell in lonely places. And that's interesting again, as I said, because in some threads of mythology, it is the Dogda who builds the she or the fairy mounds for them. And it is the Dogda who is their leader. So Dogda and Mananon clearly uh, change places. These are the fairies which people saw. There is a house in Luch Solosh 
which was built on a rath or fairy pass uh, and that means the lake of the light when it was being built the amount built on one day was knocked down the next day this happened several days and the people thought it was done for torment and this story doesn't appear to be about Mananon. so there you go but just before we finish if there are any questions or comments please feel free to make them i'm seeing uh, live comments here gordon stewart is watching hello gordon jennifer uh, says well done thanks jennifer hope you're enjoying it i'm figuring that this whole uh, theme about Mananon, perhaps not originally being of the two at adanon uh, is an interesting one and someone i may turn to in that regard for a little bit of expert knowledge would be uh, uh, mark williams in ireland's immortals so very briefly going to search for Mananon in the index and see uh, oh, oh <laughs> yes i just looked up Mananon mclear and there are literally dozens of entries so that's not going to be easy uh, in classical music connection with the isle of man and diplopia esoteric form of father of mongong mcfiechny in ferguson gungal as husband magic boat of meaning of epithet meaning of name modern statue also named <laughs> paired off with bridget type of christian god vaguely fascistic Welsh Mananon. Oh, there is so much there. I mean, you know. Oh, it looks like we could be talking about Mananon all night. Just let me briefly just check if there's anything in particular that we should be um, mentioning in relation to Mananon. There are hints from elsewhere that wisdom was a quality associated with Mananon, which would correspond to his deep knowing in our text. Yeah, I think there's too much to delve into there tonight. I would have to kind of go through this, make notes and come back again, you know, because this is. Um... The adventure of Conley and the voyage of Bran inaugurate the tradition, but in doing so, they invert themes relating to the mythical sovereignty god, goddess. The sea, the, to the mythical sovereignty goddess, it does say goddess, the sea god Mananon. And the people of the she okay yeah yeah he's 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 this this mythical sovereignty goddess and the sea god mananon are two different uh, characters yes but that's something we'll have to come back to more more i know you want more i know can't give it to you right now and in any case we've gone over the hour uh just a reminder uh that uh I, i'm trying to do these every day uh i do thankfully still work full time through the current crisis uh, the times will sometimes differ. Uh, I, it seems to be better to do it later in the Irish evening, uh, sort of 8, 9, 10 p.m. Sometimes I have to do it earlier in the evening or in the afternoon um, because I also have a family and there are seven of us here and there are there is a domestic agenda. So uh, I generally announce the topic for the day sometime around the middle of the day, sometimes at lunchtime, um, you know, on the Mythical Ireland Facebook page and on the Mythical Ireland community page on Facebook and on Twitter, if you're on there. And when I can remember, and I sometimes forget, also on Instagram. Uh, so the theme is announced and also the time of the broadcast. But don't worry if you can't make it to the live broadcast. I will save this as a video. It will be saved on to Facebook first and foremost. But I also upload a copy of it onto my YouTube channel. Now, if you want to look at the previous episodes, they're all available in the same place on the Mythical Ireland blog. Uh, and there's a short link to that, which is uh, bit, bit.ly, bit.ly, live Irish myths, I think. I'm just checking that before I do it, just to make sure that is correct. And it is correct. So I'll paste that in as a comment. Live Irish myths and all of the episodes uh, as YouTube versions are available there. Uh, that brings you to that page there in as a comment um what else if you only want to listen to it as uh, a podcast um they're all available on actually I, I i forgot to upload episode nine yesterday but they're they will be when i'm finished here they'll all be available as podcast uh, on my mixcloud page which is also below and just a reminder again that if you would like to support uh, mythical ireland uh, feel free to check check me out at patreon.com forward slash mythical ireland where if you like you can become a patron and a supporter 
of Mythical Ireland for reward. Everybody gets a reward uh, for uh, donating uh, on, on a on mon monthly basis. In the meantime, there don't seem to be any more questions. People are just saying thanks, which is great. We appreciate all you can do. Thanks, Dana. Freya says, looking forward to the next one. Margaret says, think, think this warrants another night. And I think you're right, Margaret. Shannon O'Hare, love these videos. Thank you so much, Mr. Murphy. We'll be following you on this for sure. Well, that's brilliant. Thank you very much. And it's great to do it. Uh, and uh, I'm learning. I'm learning as I do it. I'm learning. Uh, and it's brilliant. It's really, really brilliant. And it is also helping me very much to keep my mind focused on the things that I love and to take my mind a little bit off current affairs and the news. And we're a little bit inundated with news about you know what. So we don't need to mention it again, says you. Aaron Durrett says, wonderful, thank you so much. Have really enjoyed these live times and getting to go back through them for references, just great. And also, I'll do my best to mention the sources uh, every time. Uh, and do try, if you can, to support the, the, the wonderful authors and scholars who have done so much uh, excellent work, uh, both uh, current and former, um, because uh, we kind of stand on the shoulders of giants in this regard. As I'm always saying, my scant knowledge of Irish mythology and folklore is not derived, sadly, from an indigenous source. Although when we were young, uh, my mother did tell us a few a few tales, uh, the more famous ones like uh, Fionn and the Salmon of Knowledge, um, uh, etc, etc. Mostly my knowledge is derived from those collectors who uh, uh, devoted themselves so diligently in past times and ages to collecting Irish myth and legend before it was lost to history. And don't forget that some of those were Christian monks in the great monasteries of Ireland who did us a great service, writing on their vellum manuscripts, uh, developed the first uh, writing in Ireland uh, and captured for posterity a lot of tales which might have been otherwise lost because uh, you know, even though they survived in folk form, uh, the folk form was dying out in the 19th century. And there isn't all that much that survived into the 20th century. Um, but thankfully, it's all making a resurgence. As usual, if you want to catch up on everything that's happening in Mythical Ireland, the Facebook page is probably the best place to start. But don't forget the website is there, mythicalireland.com and the blog section uh, uh, in which you'll find a very heady mix mixture of stuff it is also a very interesting section to go to and that's also as a link below thank you all very much it's it's been a wonderful evening that's episode 10 i started this on the day that the covid19 restrictions were announced in ireland as a means to try and help us through it and keep our minds off it this is episode 10 i'm hoping that i can keep it up and i'll try my best to do it every day and hopefully entertain us i mean you can see that some of the stories are quite funny and they have funny turns and some of the pronunciations are a little bit challenging but we'll we'll get through it don't forget also if you have follow-up questions and i'm getting loads of interaction both on the youtube comments and on emails that if you have a follow-up comment and you're watching this on youtube and you haven't been watching live and you're catching up on it that if you have a question feel free to drop me an email at mythical ireland at gmail.com or you can go to the contact me page on uh, the mythical ireland website which i will also paste below and uh, keep enjoying the stories as i hope to do we'll see you all have a very nice weekend uh, wherever you are in the world as uh, some of you are uh, uh, in tomorrow already uh, most of us i think who are on here are still in uh, uh, saturday but some of you some of you are into sunday Ihawa, uh, good night, August Banacht, uh, blessings to each and every one of you. Ismisha, Anton, and this is Mythical Ireland. <laughs>